Okay, so in this uh, video series, we're going to be talking about lofts a little bit. Actually, we're going to go through this uh, fairly thoroughly. We're going to start with just the basics in the very beginning, and we're going to add uh, more complexity to this. There's not going to be a whole lot of sketching and uh, making the plans in this, except at the very beginning. And then I'm going to show you how to, you know, some of the more complicated features that lofts are able to create. So we have a uh, we have a couple different uh, tools that we use up here in regard to the lofts. So we have our uh, lofted uh, boss space up here, which is going to be the tool we're going to be using uh, initially. But we also have a complementary tool to that. This actually adds material to it. But the lofted cut uh, takes away material too. So we're going to incorporate that into this. And I can't think of a better model to demonstrate lofts on than something like this, which is kind of an exotic shape. It would be really hard to get something like this by simply using extrudes and uh, cuts. And uh, even a revolve feature up here, we could probably get something that would approximate that. But you can't really get anything that really looks like that, where you have it kind of flares out over here in the back, where you have the claw, where you can put this profile in here to be able to pull nails out. You also have a loft in here too, between the top and the bottom over here in the cut, a loft to cut in here that uh, actually gets a little bit bigger as you go towards the top. So you're able to put uh, you know, your wood stock handle in here and actually put something in on the top, like a, you know, a piece of, a, you know, you put a little cut in there and you put a wedge in there to help expand that out a little bit in the top. That's incorporated in the Model 2. So there are a lot of, a lot of little nice things in here and uh, at the very beginning of this video, we're going to start from the very beginning, we're going to take a rollback bar and roll that back all the way to the beginning and create a couple different plans. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, we'll create some profiles and then we'll extrude essentially the way a loft works is you're going to extrude from one profile to the next. So if you look up here to this very top feature called the front head, if we take a rollback bar and roll that back to that, what we have in here are three different planes that uh, we're using to drive this. So we have a plane number one. Actually, we're using the very front plane initially. We're using a front plane over here to create that uh, initial profile. Now we have our plane two and plane three. It's not really very clear there because the planes are really big uh, compared to what we can see in the video. But if you go to the profiles, now you can see what the profile looks like on the front plane. Profile number one, uh, profile front one, which is on the uh, front plane one up here. It's an offset plane by, uh, what does that say? Uh, half an inch, and it's a round profile. And then after that, we're going to go to another but larger round profile. And then uh, profile number three on uh, plane number three, it's got that same uh, profile uh, diameter to it. So essentially, we're going to go from a rectangle to a circle, back to a larger circle, and then that same large circle over here, and we're going to extrude between them. But there is also something else that helps guide us. It's called a guide curve, which kind of keeps that constrained. There are a lot of variabilities and choices that you can go through with lofts, and I'll try to show you as many as we can. But uh, there's a regular loft feature in here. If we take our rollback bar and roll that down a little bit, we put in our back claw back here. And uh, what it does is uh, we have a, a profile over here on, again, on the front plane, but I call it the back. And it's got a, a square uh, or a rectangular profile to it. And then down at the bottom, we have another profile down here. And then we have a guide center line, which goes down the middle of this, which helps guide that. Otherwise, we'd just go straight from that uh, rectangle to this rectangle at a diagonal. Now we can kind of control how that uh, comes, uh, comes about. So then we have our lofted cut. We put a cut back here for uh, the nail puller, and uh, that was a little tricky, but I'll show you how to put that together. And that too is uh, guided by guidelines. So if you take a look at that lofted cut, very similar. We have a profile back here, kind of a triangular uh, profile there, and then we have a triangular profile on the bottom down here, and then we have a guide curve that uh, helps guide that. And then other planes too. Uh, we have our, our shank. Uh, uh, a lofted feature, a lofted boss space, and, uh, and then beyond that we also have another lofted cut which uh, allows us to put in the handle. So uh, it's a little bit bigger on top, a little bit smaller on the bottom, which allows us to put in that handle, make a cut in the top of that handle, and to put a wedge in there in order to make sure that that handle stays within the hammer. But again, we're going to start from the very beginning, and uh, we're going to take a rollback bar uh, just underneath the origin, and we're going to create some very simple profiles with geometry that relate between those profiles and do a lot between them. So before we get uh, started, let's go ahead and take some of our view settings and uh, let's turn those off so we can see a little bit clearer what we're doing here. This is great to be able to demonstrate it, but let's uh, go up here to our uh, heads-up view toolbar 
and open up our view settings and what I have in here right now are real real view graphics ambient inclusion perspective and shadows and shaded mode so we know what's going to happen if you take off our shadows which is you know those shadows actually look pretty good let's go ahead and click off to the side here too ambient uh, occlusion You'll notice it kind of gets light inside here. Ambient occlusion is kind of a graphic uh, feature that takes in consideration different walls that might be in there and how light's going to reflect off of that. And one way to think about that, if you look up in the corner of the ceiling in a lighted room, that you'll notice that each corner up there, all three uh, planes that come together in that corner, kind of have a different look to it, uh, depending on how the, where you're at and how the light's going to reflect it around the room. So that's ambient inclusion just in a real short thing. Of course, perspective uh, kind of puts it uh, you know, flat out, so it's uh, kind of a you know, straight-on geometry that we typically use for modeling. Now let's go ahead and uh, take off real view graphics. You'll notice that uh, with uh, the material we have over here, which is uh, cast stainless steel, that uh, what you get for the view over here is going to be uh, kind of a uh, dimpled surface in a way, which is typically of uh, what you might get in a cast uh, you know, casting process uh, using sand. So now we're going to go ahead and take that off. And we're going to go back to our regular uh, view over here. So if you go over here to our uh, task uh, pane and uh, go ahead and choose our scenes over here underneath uh, the appearances, scenes, and decals. Let's go to basic scenes and we're going to go scroll back up and we're going to go to something from what we've chosen down here. One of these items down here, I think it was probably Office Space. I like that. I like that name. I like that movie too. But typically, we choose the th third one down, which is three point faded. And what you do is you just drag that uh, material into that or that property into your screen. And now we're back to where we uh, were before. We're back to a point now where we can actually begin to model this without a whole lot of interference. Now let me show you one more thing too. Let's take a future manager tree and kind of condense this a little bit so we see all the elements in here. With all these planes in here, if we go up here and I turn them all off because I have them all showing and you know they're going to be showing if they're blue color over here in a future manager. But I went up here to show all types or hide all types. Hide show is what the button is. If we go ahead and click on that, now we can see all the planes that are associated with the model that I put here and all the different uh, loft features, whether they be lofts or lofted cuts, that help drive the model. So we might want to go through this uh, later and maybe turn off some of these planes, but uh, kind of show you the little bit of the complexity here of the model. Uh, you know, all these planes that we have in here don't necessarily have to be on, and we could simplify things by turning those off. So we're going to take each one of these uh, separately and just go ahead and hide them, and then we're going to go ahead and show them one at a time as we need them. So I'm going to do that between our break here and then we'll come back here in just a few minutes. Okay, so I did leave the front plane on and uh, we're going to keep that on here for a bit so we can see what we're doing a little bit better. And let's take a rollback bar and we're going to roll it just underneath the front uh, head. And let me show you how this got put together. So if we go to the front head and actually uh, right click on that, uh, you can see some of the options associated with uh, the law feature. So we start with the profile front, uh, and then we went to profile front one, which is a circular profile. Front two, which is that circular profile, a little bit bigger, and it's actually kind of moving out away from the front plane uh, towards us. And then uh, the profile number three. And then we also have this guided by these two guide curves. You can see those up here uh, as a kind of a purple line, both top and bottom. And the guide curve is just a very simple, uh, you know, sketched on the right plane. You know, a couple different lines which kind of intersect the geometry of all three or four of our profiles that we have. So I put one on the top, one on the bottom, and then we can go ahead and choose that loop. And I'll show you how to do that here too. One thing you also notice about uh, the loft is that we now have these like uh, little pull points on them. And uh, we can actually change those pull points around and move those around a little bit. It's a lot easier to do on a rectangle than it is in a circle. It's really hard to define them on a circle. So it's hard to kind of get that consistent sometimes. There are little tricks that you could use to try to make it more consistent. But if you pull on these, and pull that like maybe in a posi position like that. It's going to change the model, the form of that model just a little bit and probably just enough to throw the mass properties off. So it's not really important, but if you're going to go between a rectangular profile and a round one, that uh, try to get these lined up as best you can. If you're going between a rectangular profile and another rectangular profile, then it becomes a lot easier to do. So other options down here, uh, we're using guide curves over here to uh, help uh, drive our model. And then, 
you know, we can merge tangent faces. There is a start and end constraints. We don't have those on here, but conceivably you can uh, pick a direction vector on that as we could, or normal to profile if we want to do that. Uh, again, the same thing with the end constraints too. And that helps uh, to guide our design, but we'll go through that here in just a little bit. But as an introduction, that's what you get in the Properties Manager when it comes to loft. So we're going go to go to the green check mark, and we're going to go into each one of these uh, profiles and take a look at those. So if we go to the front profile, you know, it's very simple. Right on the front plane, uh, we have a, a rectangle, uh, 3 quarters of an inch by 1.1 inches, uh, which is what I was able to measure on the hammer that I was using. Now if we go to the front profile number one, that's going to be in the plane that's uh, offset for now. So that's the front plane number one. So I could tell that to show. And uh, that profile actually next down to uh, 0.6875. And it's, uh, that plane is going to be offset from the front plane too. So that's essentially what you do is you offset those planes. You make those planes parallel if you want to have your, prof, uh, your loft uh, profiles to be parallel to each other. As you remember in the back of the hammer where you have that claw back there, uh, they were not par parallel, so we lofted between one uh, plane and uh, we lofted that uh, geometric uh, sketch that's on that plane to another uh, sketch on a plane that was at an angle to it. And you could do that too, but if you do something like that, you probably want to have a guide curve in there to do that and get that uh, form just right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, rebuild that. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at uh, plane number two with uh, with the next profile. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at that. And if you go ahead and uh, edit that, you can see that. Now let's go ahead and take some of these sketches and show those too. So now you can see, kind of see what we're doing here. We're going to go from square to the small circle to the larger circle. And eventually, we're going to get up to this circle here, the profile number three. So if we go ahead and rebuild that, and let's go ahead and show that uh, profile. And we're going to show all the profiles here. Now you can see uh, the loft that uh, got created and the profiles that help shape that loft. Okay, so let's create our first loft. We're going to use some of the geometry that we already have in place. We're going to add some additional geometry, and I'm not going to bore you with uh, showing you how to make a, you know five or six different planes and put our profiles in each one of those. I think once I show you how to do one plane, you should be able to figure out the rest of that. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and back out of our model a little bit on our screen. Let's go ahead to uh, our loft, our front head loft up here. We're going to go ahead and suppress that. We're not going to get rid of it. We're just going to suppress it. But we can still use the profiles that we have in here and create uh, yet another loft. So the question might be here is how do you uh, uh, offset these planes? How do you create planes? We haven't uh, really covered that in class yet. So let me show you some of the options. I'm going to show you the options that I use in order to create these parallel planes. And we'll talk about planes in a little bit more de detail in a different video. But essentially, if you look at some of these planes, we have our front plane lit up, our plane number one, plane number two. We don't have plane three lit up yet, so let's go ahead and uh, show that. And now you can see all the profiles in those planes. But if you if you click on or just uh, select uh, plane number one, you can see you have a half inch uh, dimension on that. And between uh, one and two, it's another half inch. And between uh, two and three, it's point uh, five six two five. So let's do this. So how do you, how do you do that? How do you get those extra planes in there? Well, it's th this is probably the easiest way of getting a parallel plane in there. If you select one plane, and remember with the control key, it, it copies that. If you select that one plane with the control key to press and drag that out, you get a brand new plane from that. So now that plane is going to be defined by front plane or front three plane. And now if you go over here to your properties manager, there are a lot of different options. You can make it parallel, perpendicular to it, you can put an angle to it. But right now it's uh, assuming we want a distance. And we're going to make this uh, three quarters of an inch. We'll make that uh, 0.75. And we're going to go to the green check mark. So now we're going to go ahead and put a profile on that. So we're going to go ahead and click on that plane. We're going to go to sketch. And we're going to uh, go to, go normal to it. So before we do that, let's uh, just make that normal to it so we could actually see uh, what we're looking at. And if you go to the normal to button, it's not really uh, cooperating here. So let's go up here to view orientation and let's go ahead and make it normal to there too. And we're going to go ahead and sketch that out. So at home, you're not going to have these other profiles, but you could try when I'm doing um, 
here simply by starting a brand new part on the front plane, sketch out a rectangle, sketch out uh, some circles, and try to lop between those. I think you uh, you should be able to get caught up in this. So I'm going to use existing geometry in here. I'm going to make uh, yet a bigger circle, perhaps. Or perhaps what might be even better than a circle is put in another rectangle in here. So we'll start with a rectangle, and we'll end with a rectangle with some uh, circles in between. So we're going to do some offsets uh, with the rectangle. We already have that rectangle in the background. So we're going to make this one like maybe 0.5. In fact, let's make that a little bit less. Let's make that uh, maybe 0.2. Don't want to get too far out of line. And then uh, we'll make this one maybe 0.1. So it's fully defined based on uh, the dimension or based on its existing geometry. If we go ahead and rebuild that, put that into place, now you can see it. Now one thing about lofts and sweeps too is that you have to have independent sketches you can have a sketch open to initiate the law of command. Alrighty, so if you had a little bit of time to work in this, uh, create a couple of rectangles, uh, a couple circles, make sure they're reasonable size to each other. Let's go ahead and loft it. As I said before, we need to have independent sketches as we do. And we have our sketch 21 up here, which is going to be part of these uh, profiles up here too. But let's go up to features. Go to Lofted Boss Space, and we're going to go ahead and select our profiles. So when you select your profiles, uh, you want to make sure that you select like maybe the top of each one of these. You don't want to select the top up here and the bottom down here, because it might get all goofed up. So we're going to go ahead and select that profile, select this profile, so now you can see a yellow preview, and now you have these little pull buttons in here that we could use to help manipulate it even more. We're going to choose the top up here, top up here, so you can see it kind of building as we go, and then we're going to pick the top over here. So now you can see our profile, what we're going to be getting. Not quite the hammer, but uh, it is uh, you know, it's a profile of, you know, of the law we're creating here. But uh, this is what, uh, what we can do with these pull buttons here, these little pull knobs. If you move those around a little bit, it kind of changes the model. It's hard to see it on the circular profile, but if you do something like that on the rectangular profile, you can see it actually twists a little bit. If you go even further, and now we lost our previous, so it's going to fail there. Here it's going to twist in the other direction here, so if you create some geometry that really can't be resolved, it's not going to like you very much. And it's going to not give you the preview, which means it's probably not going to resolve itself. So very simply, if we just go to the green check mark, now we have our first loft. And we could probably take our sketches over here and uh, t uh, turn those off, tell them to hide. And there's our there's our loft, and we can turn off all those sketches too if you want to do that. We'll keep the first one up there, and uh, there's our there's our loft. It's over here inside this um, uh, feature over here called Loft One. Of course, we can rename that. And you notice that we borrow that, so the sketch has kind of got that little hand underneath it, which means it's borrowed between different features. So we borrowed it from the front head over here, and it's borrowed down here. And uh, of course, Sketch 21 is uh, independent, it's not used anywhere else, so it's got the regular Sketch symbol over here in our Feature Manager tree. Okay, so let's uh, declutter this a little bit. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to pin in uh, some guide curves in this in order to help uh, drive our design a little bit. But if we go to the Hide Show button up here in the Heads Up View toolbar, if we just click on that, it's going to hide all our plans. So what it does is it hides everything in here. And if you're clicking at it one more time, it's going to go ahead and light everything up as long as it's uh, lit up uh, within our uh, feature manager tree. So everything is lit up over here. Everything is highlighted in blue over here. It's going to show when you click on that button. So it's just like a real quick click on this. Don't show me any of that stuff. And it kind of gets it out of the way. So let's bring back our profile. So let's, uh, we already have our profile number one showing. So let's go ahead and uh, actually just show that. So what we want to do is we want to show sketches. And if you go ahead and click on that and open that back up, we can actually tell it to not show us plans, but we can actually keep it uh, showing some of our sketch profiles in here. So let's take all of our sketch profiles that we want to see, and let's go ahead and show those. And this last one down here, Sketch 21, we're going to show that too. So let's go ahead and create some uh, reference geometry in here. What we want to do is we want to sketch stuff on the right plane. And we want to sketch uh, some geometry in here, some lines and arcs in here. It's going to pretty much connect all this together. You need to make sure that when you do your sketches in here that everything kind of intersects uh, the model geometry that we have in place. 
So we're going to take our loft one. We're going to go ahead and just uh, declutter that a little bit. We're going to suppress that and we're still going to keep our sketches. If we go to our right plane, go to sketch. Now let's make sure we're normal to that. So we're going to pick our normal button over here. And let's go ahead and sketch uh, some lines out. So we're going to start over here. Maybe uh, tilt that to the side a little bit and sketch a line out. And then from that we're going to go ahead and sketch another line. We're going to come back to that and get that tangent arc. And maybe over here another tangent arc going over the top and over here another tangent arc. And maybe from this point we'll just do a line and we'll kind of get up here. So you want to make sure each one of these uh, intersects uh, our profiles in here. So this is a real easy one. We can take that end point of that line and this line up here. Here's a new sketch relation up here. It's called Pierce. Sometimes you see coincident, which means it kind of puts it on the same plane. But if you do Pierce, it's actually going to pierce that line right at that point. So conceivably, you might be able to do that to each one of these, but we don't really have a point to pierce here. We might be able to select this midpoint here and click on that profile, and we can tell it to pierce that. If we make a coincidence, here's that situation where it actually puts it on the plane, but it doesn't necessarily put it on that profile. So let's go ahead and grab that midpoint there and uh, go ahead and grab that profile and see if we could do a pierce, and that's going to put it there. So that's kind of kind of getting out of control here. But there's other, other things we could do here too. We might be able to constrain that a little bit by maybe taking this endpoint and that line over here and piercing that. Bring this down a little bit. Of course we want these to be a uh, tangent. Another way of doing this is to put a line, a point, on the arc or the line. Uh, just arbitrarily put it out there and we could tell that if we click that profile on that point. We could tell that to be coincident maybe. Puts it on the same plane. But Pierce is the better relationship there. So we're going to do the same thing over here. We're going to put a point in here, an arbitrary location, take that point, put that on that uh, curve, and make that coincident, not coincident. Gosh darn. We're going to make that uh, Pierce. We're going to Pierce that. So try that one more time. That point, that profile, uh, that uh, circular profile, and we're going to put that in place. So we still have a little bit of flexibility in here. So let's go ahead and move some of this around a little bit if we can, and maybe define this a little bit better. So it's a little bit close to that point of here. I was hoping to be able to pull that aside, but I think we could do that if we crank that up in that direction a little bit. So kind of like what we did before, let's go ahead and put in some, some relationships. Let's put an angle relationship between this, that, that line, and uh, that center line until we get this fully defined. So we'll make that 70 degrees. Maybe some radius uh, dimensions in here. 0.5 looks good. We're just going to go ahead and round these up a little bit. 1.2 perhaps. We really only need a couple in here before that gets fully defined. So if we go ahead and rebuild that, we have our sketch 22 down here. We can call that our guide curve if you want. And we'll go ahead and keep that 22 number, but we'll call this guide curve. Yeah, I think that's how you spell it. All right, and we'll come right back. All right, so back to our loft. If we were to go back to our loft one, let's go ahead and right click on that and tell it to unsuppress. Not really going to consider the guide curve, but now you can see what the guide curve might be able to do for us. Uh, we could actually make it uh, adhere to this profile, the guide curve profile over here a little bit more. And if we put a guide curve in the bottom, which I think we're going to have to do, uh, we could probably uh, manipulate the, that too on the bottom. So it's, you know, it might be able to conform up here, but it might bulge out down here in the bottom. So let's go ahead and try that and see what we could do. If we go to loft number one and go to edit feature, uh, we could probably put that guide curve in here, but I get the feeling the guide curve was right underneath where that loft was. So I don't know if we're going to be able to select that. And that uh, guide curve is guide curve number 22. So that's kind of a weird thing about the loft. Because that loft is in place and because that guide curve is based on geometry within that loft, and because that becomes after that loft, uh, we're not going to be able to choose that. And I don't think we're going to be able to put that any higher in a tree than where it is right now. So one thing we could do is just redefine that loft. We right click on that loft. Let's go ahead and delete that for now. It's going to go ahead and release all of our profiles. And let's just go ahead and reestablish that and include that guide curve in there too. So if we go to features, we have uh, all, all of our independent sketches in here. One, two, three, four, five, and six for our guide curve. So if we go up to features, lofted boss space, we're going to pick our profiles again. And this time we'll pick the side just to be different. 
So each one of these sides, you'll notice that those uh, pull points are going to be on the sides too. And you want to make sure that this last one is you know, relatively close to that one up there. So let's go ahead and pull that up there. And then our guide curves. And now we're going to pick our guide curve. So if we pick on this line up here for our guide curve, you need to make sure over here in the Properties Manager, you go to your selection box for guide curves. If we click on that, it kind of changes a little bit. So if you look in the top, you notice it uh, does conform to that now. But on the bottom, it's going to exaggerate that a little bit. So if we were to go to our green check mark, take a look at that. Now it kind of conforms to that guide curve on the top only, but not on the bottom. And if we were to take that guide curve, and now that it's incorporated into our loft, maybe change that a little bit, maybe take the geometry and make it a little bit more extreme. Let's make that maybe two, maybe. Oh, doesn't like that. Actually, let's make it a little bit less. Let's see if we can make that one. Now let's take this angle over here and make that maybe 60 degrees a little bit more steep. I think this might uh, provide us uh, with uh, the view that we're looking for where it's going to exaggerate it. It's going to be uh, um, okay on the top, but when the loft uh, regenerates on the bottom, it's going to be uh, fairly exaggerated. So if we go ahead and rebuild that, now you can see what it does. So now we have that guy curve on the top uh, driving everything that's on top of the model, but everything on the bottom of the model is a little bit more skewed. It may not be the form that we're looking for. And conceivably, if you really want to do this right, we'll probably have guide curves on the left and right hand side too in order to get a symmetric form, but the top and bottom guide curves will do the bulk of the work in this type of model. Well, now what do we do? If we want the model to be a little bit more symmetrical than what we're looking at here, uh, we're going to have to do something with that guideline. We're going to have to take that guideline that's on top and try to put that in the bottom. So we can go down here to our Guide Curve 22, go to Edit Sketch, and just uh, do a simple mirror option. So we can uh, take a starting line from the origin over here. Even though the model is skewed a little bit, you want to make sure right next to the cursor that you see that horizontal uh, sketch relation preview that you're going to get. Then we can take that line, right click on it, select chain. If you go to select chain after you right click on it, you can select everything instead of having to you know, pick it one at a time. Click on that line and just go right up here to mirror entities in the sketch toolbar. Uh, it's part of the command manager and it uh, mirrors it down to the bottom. So now if we go ahead and rebuild this, uh-oh, uh-oh. We're going to exit the sketch and see what's going on. It doesn't like that guide curve because now it's got two lines, two curves, uh, you know, two sketch entities in there to try to try to work with. So let's go back to our loft, right clicking out, let's go to edit our loft and see what it's looking for. So it gives, it gives us an error down here for guide curves. It's that, uh, got that goldenrod color uh, that uh, denotes it's kind of dangling or an error. We're going to go ahead and right clicking out, we're going to go ahead and delete it. And now we're going to go ahead and click on our guide curves in here. So we're going to click on this one over here. And you get this dialog box up here, which allows us to do a couple different things. We can select uh, the closed loop, which we don't have, so it's not going to let us do that. But we can select the open loop, which is going to be this line over here. We can just select that exclusively. And then we have other options in here to uh, select a group. We don't need to do that. We don't really have a group of items in here, too. We can select a region like you would with a contour select tool. And then uh, standard selection, which is what we would typically do if there was just like one element in here to choose. So the correct option over here, and it defaults to that, is going to be select open loop. Go to the green check mark. Now that's in place. But we can also go back over here with our selection box still open and select that bottom curve in here. We're going to do the same thing. So watch what happens. It uh, conforms to the profile up here, and down here it's going to conform to that guide curve too, if you choose that option and the green check mark, and now it pulls that into place. So it's a little bit symmetrical, left and right too, if we uh, look at that, but we could also put a guide curve, or a set of guide curves on the top plane here too, if we want to do that to really uh, confine that model a little bit more. So if we go to the green check mark, now we have that in place, it's uh, more symmetrical than it was before. And that's how you use guide curves with lofts.
Okay, so now that we have guide curves in place and it's a bigger model, a little bit more symmetrical, about to plane in the middle, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some other options that we have in here. So these are more obscure options, but they're worthwhile options too. If you can't apply them right now, they're good to know that they're there and you have a resource here that you'd always come back to. So let's go back to our loft. Let's go to, uh, let's go ahead and edit that feature. And let's take a look at what we're going to do and some of the different options that we have. So, hmm, it's being a little slow here, but uh, we're going to be patient. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to start from the top and work on make sure we have everything uh, uh, covered here. What we haven't covered yet are the start and constraints. And if we open that up, we uh, take a look at it. Uh, so our start constraint, or our start is going to be over here. Our end constraint is going to be over here. It's just where we put this together. And we have uh, three different options. We could do none which means it's just going to do its own thing here. Or we could do a direction vector, but let's look at uh, normal to profile first. And before we do that, let's just go ahead and scoot in on this and take a look at that from the edge and kind of get an idea of what that might do. So if we go to uh, normal to, uh, to profile, you're going to get something like that. So now you get this like magenta arrow that sticks out. And if you look at the profile of that in yellow, it's kind of sticking out a little bit. So what it's doing is it's uh, being normal to the profile. So it starts normal, comes straight out perpendicular to this plane over here, and then slowly begins to curve. So we can actually define that a little bit. So we could define it by angle, or we could define it by, I, I think that's a percent, 1 to 10, uh, from where the curve begins to get a little bit more skewed. But let's uh, look at an angle first and see what that does. So let's maybe put in 10 for the angle. So now it looks like it's uh, starting about 10 degrees down instead of going straight out, perhaps. Let's just check that and go to maybe 30 and see what that does. Doesn't like 30. Maybe 20. So yeah, there it goes. Okay, so that's uh, actually it doesn't go 10 degrees down. It's going about 10 or 20 degrees in this instance, actually going up above that arrow. So if we go back to 10, now you can see what that's doing. It's kind of getting closer to that arrow. And if we put in zero, it's going to go right at that arrow. So it's going to be right normal to that back plane. So here's a percent in a way. If we right now it's about 10%. Uh, actually goes uh, from maybe 0.1 to 10. So you have 100% in there, but uh, if you consider that arrow, that arrow is not a static length, so you know if you zoom in on the arrow, it gets, you know, it's the same size on the screen. It's not relative to the model, but it's the same size on, to, uh, on the screen as we see it. It has no reference to the model, but we can take that arrow and pull that a bit. So we could actually pull it. It goes up to a maximum of 10, and you see it's going to get really distorted here at 10. And that's going to be the maximum before it actually goes into something that fails. But if you go to the green check mark and take a look at our model and see what that does, you know, that has quite a bit of distortion. It's almost getting to the point where it's going to fold over on itself. So let's go back to the loft and check this out. We can probably use, uh, find something that's a little bit less drastic, maybe five on that. And maybe uh, we could go down to zero would be uh, the first uh, way would be to initially. So starting a normal profile. But uh, if we go to zero, what happens there? It says, uh, please enter a number greater than or equal to 0.1 and less than or equal to uh, 10. So yeah, so we can't go to zero. But we can start at 0.1. And if we do that, so now uh, the influence of that curve uh, is much less. If you go up to 5 or 10, like we were before, the influence of that curve is much more. So what that does is it kind of gives you a relative distance uh, of that uh, magenta arrow up here and its influence as it goes towards uh, the center of the model. So again, point one is get the minimal amount of influence. And again, you can grab that magenta arrow and pull that all the way out. 10 has got the maximum amount of influence before that begins to distort, and that curve begins to fold over on itself. So we could do the same thing with the other end, too. So right now it's none, but exact same uh, items down here. But um, let's go ahead and cover one more thing in here, and that's direction vector. That's another way of uh, controlling this. So what it's looking for is a direction that it wants to uh, make that uh, curve in a way, kind of an extrusion. You think about this uh, profile here, extruding into that profile. We can direct that. And if you were to click on this as our direction vector, it's looking for a selection box up here. It's going to go right down as we would anticipate, as we would want it to do, right down that, uh, you know, down that line. So I don't think that's anything new. It would probably default to something like that. 
But we could choose something else over here too. We could actually choose maybe this line over here, which is another straight line. Or if we had model geometry in here that we could actually choose in the background, we could do that too. So now you can see what it's doing. It's actually following that line and it's getting really skewed here. And if you were to add uh, some additional degrees onto that, I don't think we're going to be able to add much more to that before the preview disappears. And we know we're not going to get that. Even a one degree, um, you know, change now it's not going to do anything. So if we go back to zero, now we get our preview. And again, it's almost folding over on itself. And if we have these options down here too in regard to the length of that arrow, or that relative length of that arrow, we could reduce its influence by doing something like that. So there's a, those are two additional options in here in regard to the start uh, constraint. Uh, typically, uh, you might right now, without doing anything, it's just going to default to none. But it gives you the choice between none direction vector that we just saw and normal to profile and of course those latter two options give you the capacity to make additional modifications depending on this arrow length that we had over here and the angle of which that starts. Okay, a few more options in here. Let's go ahead and look at our guide curves and see some of the options associated with that. If you go down to here to this uh, pull-out box, uh, we have uh, four choices. We have up to next guide, to next guide, uh, to next sharp, to next uh, edge, and global. And this uh, tells us how the kind of influence that our guide curve is going to have. So if you look at this from the very edge, uh, kind of looking down on the, on the right plane over here, uh, you can see that everything's kind of conformed to the guide curves. But if you look at it from the side over here, you can actually see that this edge down here specifically uh, is kind of chisel shaped in a way. And it does, uh, it uh, still maintains, it's nice and flat on this edge. And transitions into the round over here too. But if you were to choose different options over here, in fact, uh, the model over here, the way it is right now, it's uh, completely influenced by the guide curve equally from the front to the back of the model. But if you were to choose something different, like up to neck sharp, and the only uh, neck sharp that we have in here is not on these rounded uh, uh, profiles, but again back up here. We have sharps back here, but we also have sharps up here too, and those sharps are beginning to influence our model a little bit. So you can see it's still conforming to the guide curve, kind of creates a valley here in the middle. If you were to look at that in the side, now you can see the guide, where the guide curve is, but a little bit of the model is kind of bulging out as it gets towards the edge, perhaps where these sharps might be. And if you try the next one, uh, up to next edge, uh, kind of it's doing the same thing. But now the valley is a little bit more broad. But uh, its influence there on this end of the model is, is definitely there, but not in this end. So it's being influenced by where that next sharp is, by the way the next edge is, which is over there on the very end of our model, the very end of our loft. So a little bit more broad valley. It's just a different way for it to resolve. And then global is uh, kind of similar to but global is also being influenced by the end of our model here too so you can st you still see a little bit of a valley here and still no valleys or any influence and in, on the front of our model so by default I think it's a little bit more geometric uh, for us up to next guide makes it nice and flat over here and it looks like from the side and nothing really breaks out of uh, the guy curve and uh, we're gonna go ahead and choose that default setting as we move forward Okay, three more options and we're going to be done. So we're going to come back to the centerline parameters. I'm going to show you that in the back of our model here, which is going to be the claw. But uh, merge tangent faces and close loft. So let's see uh, what that does. Right now it's merging tangent faces. So if we go to the green check mark, and we're going to have to change our uh, display style, and we're going to go up to uh, shade of edges, and take a look at that. What it's doing is it's merging our tangent faces and uh, it's uh, going to take our faces on the very top on either side of this and the same thing on the bottom and it's going to merge them together. So let's take a look at, uh, at the difference here. If we go back to our loft and uh, make a modification to that and uncheck that, now you'll notice that we kind of have a seam down the top of this and we have the same thing on the bottom down here. So this would be a tangent face that would uh, that's end up uh, getting merged. Let's do something even more drastic than this. Let's take our loft and let's go ahead and suppress that. Let's go ahead and use uh, some of the elements that we have in here and just create a new loft. So a loft of boss space. Let's choose maybe the first three profiles and put that together. And then uh, go to the check mark. Let's do, yeah, let's do, uh, let's do that many. Go to the green check mark now. If you take a look at this, our tangent faces, 
you know, we only have uh, four of them, one in the top, one on the side, one in the bottom, and one on the other side. If we were to right click it and see what our options are, so right now it's merging tans and tangent faces. If you go to the green check mark, it kind of looks the same. It, there, there really are no tangent faces in here to really merge or unmerge. So it kind of looks the same both ways, but we can influence this even more if we want to do this uh, by taking that first uh, profile, that front profile, and adding some more stuff to it. So let's take a fillet. Let's put a fillet on each one of those corners up here, a sketch fillet. Make that maybe two tenths of an inch. And click on each one of these points in here, and we're going to go ahead and put that in. And now we have a round profile from the front all the way to the back. So kind of rectangular with the rounded edges to it. But that will definitely influence our model a bit. So let's go ahead and rebuild that. And now we have that. So now, if you uh, notice that we still have in our display style, we still have shaded with edges on. If you go to our Loft 3 and actually take a look at that, we have uh, merged tangent faces, so now all the faces are merged together. If we were to select in any one of these surfaces in here, we select everything. So let's unclick that and see what we got. Let's uh, like not merge tangent faces and see how many faces we got in here. So now we have uh, a face on the top, face on the side over here in that uh, corner, and we have faces all the way around. These would normally be tangent faces, and so this gives us uh, the opportunity to actually select that face and be able to do something with that uh, a little bit later. So that's what uh, Merge Tangent Faces is all about. You could either have a nice smooth model where all the tangent faces are merged together. And as you saw in this model when we did that, if we were to right click on that yet one more time and take a look at that and go ahead and merge all that, what we end up being, if the model was uh, built correctly, uh, we end up having just one giant, you know, all-encompassing face that uh, can be selected. Okay, the last thing I'd like to show you is uh, the closed profile or the closed loft. What that does is it essentially takes your uh, curvature that you have in here, or if they happen to be straight lines, if they're not influenced by uh, guide curves, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to take that profile in here. If it's cupped up or down, uh, it's going to go ahead and mirror that over to the other side and resolve the loft with an open, uh, opening in the middle. So because we have an inflection here, we're going between a curve that's curved down or curved up here and then curve down over here uh, where it's open on the bottom and this is open on the top it's not going to allow us to do that because those lines are going to intersect so we're going to go ahead and take one of those profiles out so if we go to uh, if we want to edit our loft 3 we're going to take that front profile out and just delete it so just press the delete button and now we have that profile kind of a truncated profile in a way and if we go ahead and uh, click on or select the close off and put that check mark in that box now you can kind of see what it's doing. It's uh, creating an open in the middle. If you see this just right, what you can see is you have a curvature on the top. And essentially what it's doing is it's mirroring that curvature from the top to the bottom. Kind of a virtual uh, center line that's going between that, uh, those points at the very end of that. And it's mirrored it on the bottom with a nice uh, smooth transition on either side. And the result of that is going to be a closed off. It's still a solid. But now it kind of looks like an engine cowling. So in a way, uh, putting lofts together like this will kind of pr produce uh, some exotic shapes in here that you may not be able to create uh, with a lot of ease otherwise. But let's hit, go ahead and go to the section tool up here on the Heads Up View tool Toolbar and kind of take a look at this. We could take that arrow, kind of pull it through our model and see what it's going to do. So it starts at the very end and it uh, cr increases that as we go through that and then eventually tapers off when we get to, from the front profile to the, to the back and of course it's at its maximum there in the middle so essentially again it's taking that curvature on the top reflecting that down you can see the orange preview of that as we rest our cursor over that and it's going to uh, kind of resolve that or revolve that about the center of this so kind of a kind of a fun exotic shape but let's go ahead and look at one last, uh, last option in here. If we were to go right click on our loft, edit that feature, and we're not going to go ahead and close that loft, but what we can do is we could add our profiles back into this simply by selecting them. So if we were to click on this one, you notice that now we have our preview. It's kind of missing because it's not going to be able to resolve that. But we haven't talked about this before, but we can take our profiles in here and our guide curves and actually change the order of them. So our front profile, number nine, we actually want that up on top. 
So let's go ahead and see what happens as we move that up. So it doesn't work really there, but it kind of works here. So what we're doing is we put it into the second position. So the first position here, the second position is there. Then it kind of works its way to the front, or the, yeah, to the front of our model where the head of the hammer is. So that kind of creates a kind of an interesting profile. Starts here, second uh, uh, profiles over here, third and fourth follow after that. If we go to the green check mark, now you can see there's a really weird shape. And if we're going to go to section, we can probably section that and see what that looks like. It looks like it's solid pretty much all the way through. It just resolves that a little, a little bit differently. So let's continue on with that. If we go to our Loft 3, go to Edit Feature. Let's go ahead and take that front 9 and actually move that to the very top and see what that looks like. We could probably take some of these other uh, profiles in here too and move those around. So if we take the actual front one, uh, the very last profile in here, and move that back to the number 3 position. So now we're starting at the back. This would be our second profile. The very last one is our third profile. And then our fourth profile is actually number 3 here. If we go ahead and go to the green check mark over here, now we see something really weird. It looks like surfaces in here. And if we were to take our section tool and move that through that again, it's not really quite resolving that right. It's a solid all the way to the back until we get to that third profile. And it does something uh, a little bit different. It looks like uh, some surfacing tools that are missing some faces in there. But it creates a, a you know, a profile, a look to that, you may not be able to get in any other way. And it's kind of fun to play around with that. may not uh, give you the model that you're really looking for, but uh, you might be able to create some exotic shapes by uh, playing around with some of the settings, as I just showed you. So the last thing we're going to do here, if we go into our Loft 3, is I'm going to show you the final centerline parameters, and we're going to be doing that on the claw of the hammer in the back of the hammer head. Okay, one last thing I'd like to show you here is how we can influence our model or the loft center model by using a center line. Uh, a line that essentially or, or a series of arcs or splines that might be used to help influence the shape of our uh, loft. So what we're going to be looking at here is the back claw. So if I were to take my rollback bar and roll that back over here to the back claw, you can see that we have a couple different profiles. We have a profile in the back. We're going to go ahead and show that. And that just borrows model geometry from our hammerhead that we have. Our profile back number one uh, we can show that and uh, you can see that this is actually a little bit wider and flatter than this profile so we're going to transition from something that's uh, squarish to something that's uh, an exaggerated rectangle where it's uh, you know got a small dimension on this side but a much longer dimension on that side and eventually we're going to be putting it in that cut in the middle of it so yeah let's take a look at that and uh, the way I put this together so I uh, created that profile in the back first, got that center point in here, and then after that I put in the guideline. If we were to take a look at that, if we were to right click on that and open that up, now we can see what that uh, center line is going to look like. And you'll notice it isn't really a center line, it's actually a model line. And I think it has to be that way. It's not going to allow you to select a center line in a situation like this, but it'll allow you to select a model line. So you're going to have to keep that in mind when you put this together. So I started up here with an 8-inch radius up to about maybe 1.4 inches. Then we transitioned into something that's a little bit tighter radius after that. If we were to put a dimension on that to see what that is, we're going to leave that driven. But uh, it's about 2 inches uh, in uh, radius here. So a nice smooth transition with that uh, tangent relationship in here. And then I measured this out. This is going to be 1.4 inches, but uh, the real big measurements uh, here is going to be this 3 inch offset to the end of the claw and a 1.5 inches from the middle of where the hammer is. So I measured that out in order to get these dimensions in here. From there, I was able to put in a plane uh, with an angle to the probably uh, the front plane. And then from there, I was able to put in a profile. And I put it right there, right at that point when I put that profile together. So if we're to look at the profile back and take a look at this, you can see, and you can't really see the guide, let's go ahead and turn that on, you can see where that, uh, how that works. So once I put this, uh, this uh, center line in here, uh, the center line parameter, uh, we went ahead and put a plane in there, and then I went ahead and inserted this sketch at the end point of that center line, what's going to be the center line, and put that uh, profile in place. So now we have the two profiles, and now we can go ahead and, and uh, loft it between those two. So normally without that uh, center line guide, uh, in here. If we were to delete that, you can see that we're going to actually go from that profile to that profile and it's going to go ahead and ignore that. It's just going to go straight over there. Not quite what we're looking for, 
but in a way by putting in that center line right through the center of our uh, loft we could avoid having to put in uh, guide curves. Guide curves probably wouldn't be as good uh, of a placement here. Uh, center line would be good. That way we only have to actually select one bit of reference geometry in order to get the shape that we want. Putting in a guide curve in here it might resolve on the top but then we'd have to put one in the bottom and you can see that going between these two profiles which are kind of different shapes here. Uh, it's going to take a little bit more work. This is a lot easier to do. So center line parameters, we're going to go ahead and choose that. It's going to choose both uh, sketch entities within that center line in order to put that together. And it's kind of giving you a preview of what we had before, but I think it's going to be okay if we go to the green check mark. There it goes. Okay, so that's our hammer model that's using lofts. All we've seen were lofts as a uh, additive feature in here, but we could also use lofts uh, to actually take away the, uh, some uh, material. So they call them lofted cuts, and here's a good example of a lofted cut back here, what it is uh, with that uh, recent claw that we added in here. We uh, put in a cut in that claw in order to provide a slot for the nails. So this round surface allows you to rock that hammer back and forth on top of a nail head and be able to pull that out. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off these uh, sketches in here because they're no longer going to need those for now. now. Let's take a look at how we did this. So we did a lofted cut. We put a profile up on top, profile back down here and our, at the very end of our loft that we had put together. Uh, so there's our profile one and it's got a triangular cut to it and our profile number two which is down here and then we have a guide curve which helps guide that so the reason I didn't use the center line for this uh, guide curve is I want to make sure that that uh, lofted cut begins to cut not necessarily right here where the triangular profile is but somewhere in the middle there so I can begin to control that so the, the critical uh, guide here the critical reference geometry is going to be a line or an arc over here from the very top going down so it's going to increasingly cut that at an increasing uh, width as it goes down there. So if we're to take a look at that uh, loft to cut, that's how it's going to work. You can see the preview, the yellow preview, what it's going to do. And as that's moving down, uh, the cut gets wider and wider as it goes down. It took a few iterations to get this right, but now you can see that. So the guide curve, we're back to guide curves again. It's guiding that uh, how it's going from this profile to that profile. And the result is going to be a nice little cut like that, which uh, really resembles uh, how a hammer might look. So then after that, put in some additional reference geometry. We have uh, some, uh, uh, we put in a uh, back claw cut filter, uh, fillet I should say, in here to kind of round that out a little bit as long as we're on that back claw. So it kind of keeps all those features together. Now we moved on to other things, so we provided some additional uh, planes in here for the shank bottom plane and the shank middle plane, and from that we created yet one more loft which uh, creates that shank. And now we did uh, just a basic uh, shank extrude uh, with a fill, and that kind of filled in that area between where the shank is and where the rest of the hammer is. And then we uh, provided a uh, profile shank uh, top plane up here. What that is, it provided a uh, kind of a surface up here that we'd actually uh, create a cut in the middle of that. And so yet one more uh, loft in here. This one's going to be a loft to cut between two profiles, a shank uh, top cut, which we put in that new plan that we created, and a shank bottom cut, which is a little bit different. This one is now going to conform to the side of the, you know, to the profile of the hammer uh, handle that we're going to create. And now we have that in place. And then the rest of it are just fillets, and that just kind of rounds out our model. So if we were to go ahead and uh, right click in this and tell that to hide and go back to some of our view properties that we're looking for. Real view graphics, uh, shadows and shaded mode, uh, ambient occlusion, which really kind of adds to that. And then probably a perspective view. Now let's go ahead and uh, get our uh, scene in here that we had before. Uh, what we have right now is uh, probably, uh, you know, it's a little bit bright, but we can uh, probably add some uh, items in here with maybe more muted light uh, uh, sources that'll probably enhance the model a little bit better. And once you do that, now we can see in almost like real view graphics what this might look like if we were to actually create that hammer with the material that we selected, cast stainless steel.